Mangal Soti Botelezi's funeral will take place this Saturday. President Cyril Ramaphosa will be among the dignitaries present on Saturday. But it has to be said, while the late Botelezi is lauded by many, he does have a controversial past. Journalist and author Beki Sisa Mnube grew up in a home that adored Botelezi, and yet he decided to denounce him and also in Carter. And he joins us in studio now. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Read your article, very powerful indeed. You write about how your dad was really good friends with Mangasutu Butelezi, and your dad hero worshipped him. Talk to me about your home and your first memories of Mangasutu Butelezi. What was he like? Well, actually, I think it dates back uh, perhaps to 1983 when my father was working as a security guard in a local farm. He came home one night and he told us, he was very excited, that he had just had a, a discussion with a farmer who was also friends with my father and also with uh, Ingos Butelez. Butelez was looking for a man who understood Zulu history and who could build what we, we, we call it Kukwan, you know, the traditional Zulu hut. And the job was offered to my father. Actually, that was my first direct interaction with anything to do with Butelez, when my father actually was rescued from a life of poverty. And how old were you in 1983? Um, could have been 1983, just maybe 12 years. Okay. And, and then I became aware of this person who's larger than life. And, and my father disappeared for some months. He, was, uh, he went to Lundi. And actually, he rebuilt. By 1987, he had completed the rebuilding of the palace of King Lechwayo in Ondin which still stands to this day. Uh, so it's a very conflicting in the sense that he contributed directly to my family um, in terms of our sustenance as a family. And um, we were living a life of poverty before that. Uh, my father had uh, odd jobs uh, on the farms and... It's no wonder then that your, that your home lauded this man because he, he rescued your family in many, many ways. Yet in 1986, you write, so you would have been, what, 15, mm. 16, you denounced him. Okay, so what, what made you do that? Well, it's a culmination of, of, my, of many things. I, I wanted to read, and my, my elder brother, who has since passed on, just brought material uh, at home from all sorts. Banned or unbanned, you know, English uh, uh, literature. And I just, I was just reading. I started reading things in English before I understood a word of English. Okay. I would read a book and, until I finished it. I remember the Fools and Other Stories by Njabulon Deben. I read the whole of, of, of that book with a little bit of using a dictionary on the side, trying to make sense of it. And um, because of that, then when my father started bringing home their speeches by Ingos Butelezi that were written in Zulu and English. It was like a treasure trove. You know, I just wouldn't, if I had a moment after looking after the cows and whatever, I just buried myself in reading this man's um, speeches. Beautifully written, emotive language, um, very strong. It will move you. It will move emotionally, will move you. You know, but my, my brother was uh, also in love with Butelezi uh, because Butelezi was a man of history and a man who was a nationalist and wanted something for the Zulu nation. So we all sort of appreciated that. Mm, mm. But then my brother was also dabbling into the ANC literature and newspapers. Don't ask me where he got newspapers because we're in a village of a, a show called Ehabin. There was no shop that sell, sold newspapers there. Mm -hmm. But my brother kept uh, a, new, uh, a two choir where he, he was doing cut newspaper cuttings. So if you miss the newspaper, it didn't matter. I will go and find that uh, she exercise. She had a veritable book. library at home. Exactly. I had affairs. a library at home. <laughs> so, and then the more I was reading, mm -hmm. the more I was like, there's something that does not make sense about this. And what was that? That everybody else, mm -hmm. but what just didn't make sense was why he was overwhelming.
he was omnipresent in our lives. Mm. At school, we had a, a, a lesson every Thursday called Ubuntu Bot, which was nothing but about the, the glorifying Butelez. And we had songs and slogans. One of them was about Ubanum Tonungapumun, who is a prince who never rest. So and then we shout, Ushe. You were kicking back perhaps at this man who seemed like a god and who had almost this cult like following. Okay, so I, I get that. But so, then things got really hairy for you because you ended up, I understand, on the Ishowe 19 hit list. Is that right? Yes, uh, just before the elections, and I was already in Durban um, at university at the time. And then I, I got a call to say, you need to be careful. I said, what is happening? They said, we just found the pamphlets distributed in the whole uh, of, the, of the village. Um, clearly marked a show a IFP office, uh, a, a, show, a show 19 we were called. All people who were suspected to be ANC activists in the area were listed there, and the community was encouraged to permanently remove us. What was at the heart then of the rift? Because those of us who were alive in the 80s and 90s, we remember those horrific reports of violence between ANC and IFP playing out in townships like Umlazi. I remember speaking to a colleague of mine in his hometown where he said you would walk the streets and there would be bodies littered on the roads. What was at the heart of that conflict when Butelezi, on the face of it, sort of said that he was almost an envoy of the ANC? It was, it, was, it was very difficult because when I started uh, mingling with the people who were in the ANC uh, underground, in the same year that I denounced Boteles in 1986, they started explaining this thing in a simpler language, you know, because I thought the struggle for me was quite simple. People are fighting for liberation. I thought fighting for liberation means getting an AK-47 and killing a white man. It was very simple. And I, I told them I already have a target. I said, no, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> you have to do political education first. Yeah, yeah. And, and that is when I started comparing the literature of the IFP and the literature of the ANC and the PAC. Mm. And I was like, no, man, we have been led astray here. Something is just does not work. Mm. And of course, it wasn't working because the, the, the violence had started immediately after the, the London 1979 um, a fallout with the ANC, which was Between all the public. Between the and the ANC, yeah. yeah. So things and went badly wrong at that point. Things went absolutely. And mm. my village was somehow protected. We were in the middle of Eshowe and Mbangin. Things were happening in Mandeni. Things were happening in Eshowe Township. Things were happening in Eskawini and all around Mbangin and, 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 and those uh, north of, of, of KwaZulu. But my village... The worst that could happen was that the people who are running away from either side of the conflict will come and stay in my village. Not a single person died in the village where I'm talking about 20 kilometers away on either How side. How do you understand that? Luck? I have no idea. It's pure luck. Mm. Uh, it's pure luck, yeah. You know, it, the truth is it was a very awful, bloody, terrifying time. Mm. Um, the ANC were also involved in the fighting. It the takes two involved, to fight. Yeah. But clearly for you, the blame lies more within Kata and with Mangosutu Botelezi. I want to know why you feel that the balance of blame is more with him. Well, we were forced to be members of Inkata mm -hmm. at school, as primary school children. Can yeah. you imagine being, holding a membership card of a political party as a primary school person? You don't have the opportunity to make an informed decision. Yeah. So that was the first red flag. The second one was in 1986, um, the whole community, including our school, were asked to contribute because Buteleze was sending his best men and women who were working for the Wazulu government to study abroad so that they could improve their, their service delivery. So it was standard. If Buteleze said something, because he, he will come as a president of the IFP, the prime minister of the Zulu king. And so he expected a contribution. And then everybody paid, but it turns out we were paying for the Caprivi trainees to go and be trained, who in turn came back and killed our people. Mm. Let's, let's talk about 
Boy Patong as an example. It was in 1992. Mm. 45 people were killed. I was just reading an account of it. It's, it was brutal. Um, and if we re remember back to the early 90s, it was a very tenuous time. We honestly didn't know which way things were going to go. Were we going to descend into all-out brutal mm -hmm. civil war in our country? Or would we make a miraculous transition to democracy? It was a very scary time. The accounts from people there, they talk about knowing people who came to attack them, that they were people from the IFP, known to be members of IFP. Yet that matter was never properly dealt with at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There were no prosecutions. As far as I know, I don't know if there were any amnesties. Um, and Butelezi always maintained uh, that he was innocent of pushing any violence. Bearing in mind that we have so few answers about that time, do you still condemn him? Butelezi was an evil man. In his arsenal, he had what was called Wazul Police. He had the Caprivi trainees. And he had later on what was called self-protection units. If we're talking about the balance of forces, the ANC only had, what, plus or minus 3,000 members of the MK that came back in the country very late. Before that, all these armies were up against unarmed people. Well, unarmed in the sense that they were not uh, getting arms directly from, from, from the ANC. Butelezi gave my father a firearm. Not just my father. When the late uh, ANC Youth League uh, president, I can't remember his name now, he said he wanted to march to Ulundi. Utelezi called all the Zulus to Ulundi. Firearms were handed as if someone was giving you a soup in a soup kitchen. Mm. You bring your ID, you write your name, Later on, you'll go and collect your, your license. But, I mean, this was a low-grade civil war. And all Amakosi were given G3 machines. Mm. But, of course, you know, th th there was fighting, but there was fighting on both sides. The ANC were also fighting. Are you saying that the balance was skewed? The balance was skewed. You'll mm. remember what happened in 1995, the Shobashobane massacre. Mm -hmm. Christmas Day, people are, 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 are doing their meals in the morning, and the Amabuto, we call them Ngata Impis. They attack the village and kill everything they could find. It's, and they were, you could see these are IFP people because they had a signature. They, 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 they will put a cloth around their, their head. And they, they will be Asegais and there will be Nobkiris, there will be firearms. Of course, if you died and you were shot using an AK-47, we will sort of, no, no deduction was very clear. These are the ANC. There was an account from a friend of mine on Facebook. He said when the IFP was trying to attack um, in Guamachu, one day he saw two men who were carrying something that looked like guitars, you know, like mm. big guitars. And they were just strolling around, smoking and whatever, as the, the IFP people were marching, crossing the, the road to attack Guamachu E and F section. Mm. He says he has never seen anything like that before. But on that very morning, there was this fire from these two men mm. that all the IFP people disappeared back into, in, into the hostels. Mm -hmm. So, of course, there was, there was fighting on both sides. And, and, and the casualties are there. Uh, and and, and it's, just, it's just unbelievable that... The ANC participated in the, in the, in the, in the TFC. Mm. They took collective responsibility for the, for the things that had happened in, in, in South Africa. Even de Klerk participated in, 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 the, in the TRC. He gave us an apology, although he was already dead. That goes a long way for the victims. I, I shared my article with uh, another person in Wazul Natal, and he just sent me a one-liner. I've shared your article with the victims. Yeah. On Monday, when this article was published for the first time, I said, no, I can't publish this on Facebook because I'll be dead by Friday. And then I, I said to people, if you're interested, I'll send it via WhatsApp. I spent the whole day, I didn't work. I spent the whole day canceling people. Yeah. My sister was raped. We slept in the open. 
My brother was, they killed my father like a dog. One woman uh, who was a teacher said, they killed my father like a dog. And nobody said a word after that. So the, what I'm, I'm trying to push against is the idea that he was a peacemaker. Right, I'm with you. He could be many things, let's but let's not call him a peacemaker. And that's what I was going to say. I mean, it, it's interesting, you know, how you say that he was actually quite wonderful to your family, gave your dad a real chance to improve your lives, wrote amazing speeches, was a brilliant writer. Um, and also, if we look in his latter years as an MP in the Democratic government, I mean, he served as Home Affairs Minister in Nelson Mandela's government. What did you make of that, bearing in mind that things did get very bad between the ANC and the IFP? Do you think that that was part of uh, Nelson Mandela's reconciliation plan, an attempt to say, please, let's all move on, or we're just going to kill ourselves and kill each other? I, I was a big fan of uh, Nelson Mandela's uh, policy of reconciliation. It took me a long time to believe in it because I still wanted, I still wanted a resolution of the war. I still wanted to see a victor. Mm. I wanted the National Party to say, we throw in the towel, you have war. We know young people and their exuberance. But that didn't happen. So at, at some stage, maybe three years into uh, post uh, about it, South Africa, I, I understood the bigger picture. And I appreciated that uh, uh, Boutelis was part of government and that there was a sense of normalcy in, in, in the country. And we could focus on the bigger things which was, was to, to rebuild South Africa. So I, I understood that and I accepted it. But the, the role he played in Parliament, it was another Boutelese there, the charming one, the one who understood the procedures pretty much well because he grew up in a legislative environment. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have that he was already, um, in, in terms of years, he was more mature than... Mm -hmm. The youngsters I mean, were do you coming. Think, do you think that he realized that it wasn't good what he did and that perhaps he grew? Because people can change and can grow and can look back and go, I didn't do the right thing. Well, he, 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 he did. What's the word? He mellowed with age. Uh, but there are words he didn't say. He didn't say with hindsight, I shouldn't have used the Wazulu police the way I did, because he was the, 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 the minister responsible for policy. And also, he was also the chief minister, the prime minister of the, mm -hmm. of, of the Bandustan. Um, but having said that, you'll be shocked when I tell you that for the past 16 years, one of my things I do as a profession is actually to write speeches. And that is in no small part to the room at home that was full of these speeches and, and magazines and just... And the, the strange thing, those years, he was called Dr. Mangosutu Gaja Butelis, Prince of Wapindangen. Somewhere around 2010 or so, because everyone was questioning this doctor, where, where did you get your doctorate? The last time we checked, you only had an honours. Then he was no longer a doctor. And then he was fighting with everybody who called him Gacha, which was his name. I know this because those speeches were there in my house and they were written in Kosi, Mangosutu, Gacha, Utelezi. So he was a man of so many contradictions yeah. that it was, for me, he was one man who was difficult to love. You know, despite his charming self, you know, the way he dealt with uh, how to. Uh, helping the royal family uh, post uh, King uh, Zuelitin to help the young fellow to, to ascend to the throne. That was, that, it was pure genius. You know, people started saying on, 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 online, every family needs a Boutelese. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so this is the same man who had mobilized a, a community to contribute so that he could have a killing squad. Mm. So he's the same one who says, this is my heritage, this is, this is my nation, and I'm going to make sure yeah. that this king... He did the same thing, actually, for His Majesty King Bo Zuelitin uh, in his younger years, when there were issues in the, in the royal family. There are always issues in the royal family. Seems so. Not just in South Africa, but everywhere. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and he has been there for, 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 
for more than three generations of, of, of kings. Mm. And that part, the only problem was that everything had to be deployed in the service of Butelezi, the dictator, Butelezi, mm. the politician. We have to wrap, but I, I can't let you go without asking, bearing in mind that your dad, Hero, worshipped him. I'm not sure if your dad's still around. Still alive, yeah. Have you ever had this chat with your dad? Have you ever been able to, between the two of you, sort of reconcile your very different views on this man? We have never, we've never done that. Um, that opportunity, I think, has passed. Uh, but I will tell you something even more bizarre. In 1994, my father came back home uh, in a shower, in, in a hub in where I grew up. He was in a jovial mood uh, that weekend. And he said, ah, your Mandela is now president. I'm going to be free. This year I'm not paying anyone for school fees. And he didn't do that. I was not, no longer at home. We had already fought in 1993 uh, because they didn't want me to do higher education. So we're no longer on speaking terms anyway. But he just said that, and he didn't pay for anybody. We said, yeah, well, you, you chose Mandela over Butelezi. This is your baby. I'm not, I'm, I, 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 I won't be bothered. That's how deep mm -hmm. the, 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 the rapture went, mm -hmm. was what running through in families. And it's not just my family. Yeah. People in, 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 in my position, they, they, they will tell their own stories. I mean, you, you, you know, uh, he was here, Pede Hub. Uh, 40 years of fighting with yeah. hotels. And, and, you know, I think what you're speaking of really is the harm and the need for healing despite the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, despite the passing of many years. And uh, I think that, that is important that we reflect and continue to reflect. As JJ was saying, we will keep reflecting. Mm. Um, but there is a need for healing as a nation and right down to, to individual families. Just thank you so much for being so open and so honest and so real about your story. I really appreciate you coming into the studio. Thank I'm you. here <laughs> not to praise him, but to bury him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Journalist and author, Becky Sisa Nube, uh, speaking to us. Do you stay with us?